Hello everyone. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the transmission and reflection of waves and later on how they interfere and how waves basically add together. So before I get into the, the whole concept here, uh, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, some of the, some of the, what makes this unit more challenging than, than others is that there's a lot of vocabulary. And um, I'm going to give you something at the end of this unit so that you can practice this vocabulary in a, in a kind of a structured way. But um, one thing that's really valuable to do if you, as you watch the lesson or, or after you watch the lesson is uh, to write down the different words, that new words, like unfamiliar words that appear in each lesson. And then just kind of have a running um, uh, dictionary going, okay? So that uh, if I use a word and then it comes up again later, you know what it means. Um, you know, or or if you don't, you don't remember, you can always refer back to your dictionary. All of the uh, all of the definitions are in your textbook, so I don't spend a lot of time necessarily defining each term, but I but I do tend to use it, hopefully in a way that kind of makes it clear as to what that is. Okay, so if we look here, um, you can see that there are two words already uh, that are new: transmission and reflection of waves. Now, the first one. Might be, uh, might not be uh, what you think, or, or like you might think you know what it what it means, but uh, you'll see what it is in a second. But reflection, I think, I think you probably have a pretty good understanding. So let's see. Okay, so when we, um, so when we talk about waves, uh, before we talk about the reflection of them, we have to talk about a few terms. Uh, so wavefront. Um, is, a, is a little like the word wavelength, right? The wavelength from last time, you remember, is the length of a wave. Well, a wavefront is the front of a wave. That's basically it. So what we're going to have here is we're going to have some kind of a wave moving through a medium, and the wavefront is the leading edge. So if, I, if my wave is going this way, then this is my wavefront. Okay, that's basically how that goes. Incident wave is a wave that's moving uh, toward a barrier. So if this side over here is the barrier, then the wave is incident like this, okay? However, once it reaches the barrier and reflects back, maybe it reflects this way, maybe it reflects this way, we'll find out, then this is what's known as the reflected wave, okay? That's really hard for me to do. I um, maybe won't do that again. Anyhow, um, okay, so there are two main types of reflection, two main types of reflection and what, uh, what um, differentiates these two uh, types of reflection is basically what happens to the wave when it reaches the boundary. All right, now this is going to be a little weird. If you think of this boundary as a wall, then this won't make a lot of sense. But um, if you think of this boundary instead as uh, what the wave is, is kind of like what happens to the wave when it gets to the end. Uh, then this is really uh, more key. We will we will bring this back to boundaries in a second, but for now, this is what happens when the wave reaches its end. So, for in this in this case here, in this little graphic, you can see the wave, and the end of the wave is here. I hope you can see this with the mouse. Uh, this little circle here, and this little circle is basically free to move. Like think of this as a uh, think of the wave as being on a rope, and the rope is attached to a little ring, and the ring can move up and down on a pole. Okay, so in this case, this is free end. It's not tied there. The ring is allowed to move however it wants along the pole. So in this case, you can see that when the wave is incident, which is now, it's incident, and then the ring goes up, and then the wave reflects on the same side. So it started here on the top, and it reflects on the top as well. So it's so the reflected wave is exactly the same, but it's traveling in the opposite direction. It's traveling not from, uh, it's not traveling towards the right, it's traveling towards the left, at least the way I'm looking at it. The opposite, uh, the, the other kind of uh, reflection is fixed end. So in this case, the wave is tied to this pole, okay? So there's no ring here anymore, it's just a, a knot. So in this case, when the wave is incident, which is now, there we go, and it reaches the boundary, then it inverts, meaning it goes back on the other side, right? In this case, it starts on the top, and it reflects on the bottom. So this is known as an inverted wave. Okay, so you can see those two behaviors here. All right, good stuff. 
All right. So what's what's important though is that upon reflection, the amplitude, which was remember is the dis the distance from the equilibrium to the in this case the crest, or down here the trough, that amplitude doesn't change. The speed doesn't change, right? The waves are still going the same speed, and frequency and wavelength don't change. In other words, the shape of the wave doesn't change. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's that's important. The only difference is that in this case on fixed end it, it inverts. Okay, so now what about if the medium changes? Now this is a little bit weird um, because normally when you have a wave, it just travels through the same medium. Um, however, uh, if you talk about a rope, for example, then you might have two ropes tied together, right? And those two ropes might be made of different thicknesses of rope. Maybe one is a thick, like um, one of those, I don't know, battle ropes that you see sometimes at gyms. And the other one is a speed rope, right? Like a really fast jump rope, really thin jump rope. So in this case, that, that would indicate a medium change. So if the medium changes, that means that the wave is either going to speed up or slow down. Um, so going back to my rope example, the idea here is that the thick rope would, would, would basically represent something that's more dense. So that big thick rope is going to resist moving because of, you know, Newton's first law, Newton's uh, inertia rather. So that more dense rope is going to resist moving. And so in that case, as it passes, as the wave passes through that battle rope, right, that thick rope, it's going to slow down. So what we do here to keep these two mediums uh, uh, to, rather than, you know, talk about the thick rope or the thin rope, we talk about the fast medium, the one that has where the wave is moving faster, right? Fast wave, fast medium. And the other one is the slow medium. So that's how that goes. Okay. So the one, so if we have these two mediums and the wave is traveling, whichever one the wave travels fastest in, that one's the fast medium and the other one's the slow medium. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, that's fine. Okay. So the idea here is that what we're, what we're interested in is we're interested in what happens when the wave reaches the boundary. What happens when the wave, which is traveling down one rope, reaches the boundary, like the, the knot that's, that, that ties these two ropes together. Okay. So what's going to happen is that you're going to see that the wave's shape changes, or more specifically, the speed, right? The speed we know is going to change because fast medium, slow medium. The speed is going to change, and also the wavelength is going to change. And that's going to look like the shape of the wave is going to change. Okay. So in this case, <clears throat> we're going to start off. We're going to start off in the fast medium. And so our wave comes here. It reaches the boundary. And then look at this. A little bit gets transmitted. A little, little bit of the wave gets transmitted through into the, into the slow medium. But that's not the whole story, right? You also have some uh, of the wave get reflected back. And that reflection back is actually an inversion. So it's kind of weird, right? It's kinda, it kind of looks like the wave almost splits into two, where some of it goes through the slow medium. And you can see that, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but in this case, it it is traveling faster through the slow medium. Like if you time it here, it's like one Mississippi, two, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. So it is going slower through this medium here. Um, yeah, so, and this, and this, uh, this, uh, the intersection here, right? This, this boundary uh, acts like a fixed end, right? The, the incident wave gets reflected, but it's now an inverse wave, right? So it's a, it's a, it inverts upon reflection. The other option is if we started the slow medium. So if we start at the slow medium, then look at this. It reaches the boundary, and there's no, and it, it does reflect, but it reflects back on the same side. So there's no inversion, in other words. So in this case, this is acting like a free end. In addition, you also have a lot of the energy get tra uh, travels into the fast medium. And again, I don't know if you can tell, but in this case, the fast medium, the wave travels a lot faster. That might not be as easy to see in this case, but keep in mind that this rope is a lot shorter than this rope, and yet the fast the fast pulse reaches the end at the same time as the slow pulse. So this one, you know, travels um, a longer distance in the same amount of time, so it is going faster. Okay, so. Um, so I've already talked about how the velocity changes, right, or the speed changes as we move from one medium to the other, certainly. Um, but in addition, uh, you can say that the wavelength changes because the shape of the wave changes. So there's that as well. 
uh, what might not be obvious is that the total energy remains constant. So even in this case where the wave splits into two pieces, if you took the energy from this little wave and the energy from this little wave, it would equal the energy that it started with, right? That's basically the law of conservation of energy. So you might expect that. Okay, so interference of waves. Again, interference is another is another new word. So hopefully by the time we're finished with this, you'll, you'll understand what that one means. Okay, so interference is basically when two waves meet, right? So, so far we've only ever been talking about one wave. And admittedly in the last example, there was a wave that got split into two. But in this case, we're always gonna have two waves and we're interested in what happens when those two waves meet up. What happens if I have a wave moving this way and a wave moving this way and they meet, what happens? Okay, that's that's an interference. Um, so basically what this is saying is that these two waves are gonna be acting on this particle where my fingers are joining. They're acting on that particle at the exact same time. And uh, we can have two possible outcomes. These waves can act constructively, meaning just like construction, right? Like, you know, construction company, the two waves uh, are gonna add together. They're gonna get bigger, in other words. When you construct something, you make something that's bigger. On the other hand, they could destruct, they could, they could interfere destructively. And if you, again, if you think about the word destruction, destructive, then in this case, the waves are gonna get smaller. That wouldn't happen in that case. Um, so let's just look at this, okay? Um, in this case, we have um, uh, a pulse coming in uh, in this direction. It's moving to the right, and we have a pulse moving to the left in this case. Those two, mul those two pulses meet, right? They meet like this. But in this case, it's imagine this one, and now with this one on top of it, right? So it's like they meet, and now they're on top of each other. So in other words, if I were to look at the, you know, you can't just have two waves sitting on top of each other like this. So what you actually get is you get a large wave. These two waves move together and they go, woo, make a big wave. But then what happens? Well, then it's like they just keep on moving past each other. And they move past each other and it's like they never actually interfered at all, right? So whatever I started with, these two waves here, they go, woo, big wave. And then they keep on moving and they're back to the exact same size that we started with. So you can see here that I'm basically always drawing transverse waves just because they're they're the most um, they're the easiest ones to to draw right transverse waves are but this works with longitudinal waves as well. So this um, this part here where the two where the, so if if I have two crests here right two crests are this this is a crest this is a crest and they come together they form a super crest right a really big crest that's the basic idea there and you can imagine the same thing uh, these are really difficult for me to do with my hands, but I could have a trough and a trough and they would make a super trough. Well, I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna do that again. That was, that, that hurt my fingers. Anyway, okay, so, but you get the idea. So a crest and a crest, boom, making a super crest. And the same thing happens for the trough. Um, the same the same exact thing happens with a longitudinal pulse. So it's just very, like I can't really show it with my hands, but the idea is that you get a, a, a compression meeting a compression and you get a super crest and a rarefaction meeting a rarefaction to produce a super trough. But don't worry so much about longitudinal waves or longitudinal pulses only because they're really difficult to draw. So the idea here is that, again, if you just go back to the to the to to these guys, I have an amplitude of this one, right? That's my one hand and I have an amplitude of this one. And when they meet in the middle, the amplitude increases, okay? But everything else actually stays the same, right? The shape of my wave doesn't change, which is a little bit hard for me to show. The shape of my wave doesn't change, but in actuality, I just have a really big wave. Big amplitude, I should say, big amplitude. All right? Now, destructive interference is totally different. Destructive interference, again, from the word, means that we should have something that's smaller. So a destructive interference happens when you have a crest coming in like this, meeting a trough, okay, I'm gonna, uh, coming in like this, this is not gonna work, I think. So, and then in this case, when these two overlap each other, they just create something that's called a node. So in this case, it's like the wave is doesn't even exist. But once they move past each other again, then the waves show up. So again, it's the idea of where these two waves come in, they come in and they're exactly the same, in this case, they're the same amplitude, but this one is 
a crest and this one is a trough. So when a crest meets a trough and they have exactly the same characteristics, exactly the same amplitude, exactly the same wavelength, then when those two meet up, you get a node, right? Where like it's like it's like the wave doesn't even move. It's like the rope or the medium in this case doesn't even move. Okay, um, and the same thing happens with the longitude and the pulse. So what? So the basic idea is that when these two waves meet each other, you get a decrease in amplitude. Again, right? This is your amplitude. This right here is your amplitude. This distance from equilibrium to the top. That's the amplitude. So when these two meet up, your amplitude decreases to zero in principle. Okay, so that leads us into this idea of the principle of superposition, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, we want to have a general rule. We want to have a general rule about what happens when this wave meets up with this wave. What does that, what does that look like? And so hopefully you kind of get a sense of this. If the waves are the exact same size, then that's pretty straightforward, right? They just cancel each other out momentarily and you get a node. But it's not always gonna look that way. And it, what I mean by that is the waves aren't always gonna have the same wavelength or the same shape. So in this case, the general rule, this principle of superposition, is we take this wave and we add it to this wave or this wave or some other goofy looking wave. Whatever the idea is, when we lay them on top of each other, we have to have some way of adding them. So really, a principle, uh, the principle of superposition says, how do we add together waves? So here's a, here's a picture from your textbook. So the idea here is that you have this wave coming in, which has a, a longer wavelength than this little guy over here. And when you lay them on top of each other, where, they're two, where the middle of this guy, is underneath the middle of this guy, which is what's been done in this picture, then the resulting, um, the resultant pulse or resulting pulse is just the sum of these two, right? So you go up and then up and then down and then down, right? So up, up, down, down. So this would be what the, what the rope would look like when those two waves met each other. And after interfering, the two pulses will just move as if they never actually moved, uh, uh, interfered with each other. So it's like it never actually happened. This is another one. Uh, this one is a little bit different in that this case I have a rectangular wave and in this case I have a triangular wave, which you might say, well, how does that happen? Uh, you can have, you can do things like this with electronics, for example. Um, not so much with ropes, but anyway, uh, so the idea here is that you have your rectangular wave, you have your triangular wave, you lay them on top of each other just like before. And so you kind of go through and you say, okay, well here, this one has an amplitude of two. This one has an amplitude of, well, two, but it's it's down, right? So think of it as negative two. So two minus two is zero. So here at the superposition, my my resulting wave is uh, has, has an amplitude of zero. And then here I have an amplitude of two. Here I have an amplitude of about uh, one and a half, but it's, again, it's, um, it's inverse, so two minus one and a half gives me about a half, so or 0 0.5, so that's why my amplitude here is 0 0.5. And you just go through the wave point by point, and here they've done it about you know to four different points or something, and uh, you get this resultant triangular wave. Okay, so when this rectangle meets a triangle, you get a triangle. But notice, it's not a triangle like you had here, right, where it's inverse, where it's a trough, I suppose. It's a triangular wave with a crest. So that's kind of how that goes. And again, once they move through each other, it's like you just get back what you started with. Okay, so the last thing for today is we're gonna talk about mechanical resonance. And this one is uh, is pretty great. Um, I think for the purposes of, uh, of, of uh, just uh, observing copyright on YouTube, um, I have a video that I that I normally show with this, but I'm going to uh, link it in on the Google Classroom so that you can see the video separately. I will put it into this um, lesson. But the idea here is that you're going to use the idea of mechanical resonance is essentially uh, in its most um, uh, uh, kind of interesting <laughs> uh, form is to use sound or to use waves more generally to break something. Okay, so so when we're talking about mechanical here, we're not talking about a machine. We're talking about something where where there's a there's a physicality to it. Okay, 
Um, it could involve a machine, I suppose, but more generally, it's just something that involves, it's like when we talked about mechanical energy before, we weren't necessarily talking about machines. We're talking about like kinetic and, and gravitational potential. So same kind of idea here. We're talking about some kind of physicality, um, some kind of physical object that is able to resonate, which is to say that it vibrates along with a sound or some other kind of wave. So I'll give you some examples here. And then, like I said, I'll link in another YouTube video that will show this in a very, in a very exciting way. Okay, so what you need to understand is that most physical objects uh, have some kind of um, oscillation to them. Just in a, in a lot of cases, this oscillation is so slow that we don't make that we don't make any kind of uh, um, observation of it normally, right? Um, so, so the idea is that things can o oscillate at whatever frequency, but they actually have a natural fre frequency. So the frequency at which they like to vibrate. Uh, so things that you have seen before, though, would be a pendulum, right? If you have a string and a, and a bob attached to the bottom and you it oscillates back and forth, then uh, you've seen that. You've If you've played on a playground swing or you've seen kids playing on a playground swing, then you know how that goes. Um, in that case, the, the the natural frequency is one where, you know, you can get it, you can get it, to go higher if you if you pump your legs or you get pushed at the right time. Uh, a guitar string or any or any stringed instrument for that matter has a natural frequency. So if you play a guitar uh, with uh, the open with the strings that are open, then it'll play at its natural frequency. We'll talk more about this when we get to musical instruments in another lesson. A wine glass, now that one you might not think has a natural frequency, but if you ever uh, wet your finger and run it across the top of a wine glass, you can sometimes get it to vibrate or hum. Uh, a lamppost or just more generally uh, trees sometimes also, if it's a windy day, you'll sometimes hear them hum a little bit as they're, as they're vibrating. Uh, a bridge hopefully doesn't have, hopefully is designed in such a way that it doesn't oscillate, but um, anyway, it can do. So the idea is that each of these objects, right, and then again, some of them are more easy to observe than others. Each of these objects has a natural frequency, the frequency at which it likes to vibrate. So the deal is that if you can um, create a, a sound, let's say, if it's if it's uh, if that's appropriate, or some other kind of um, oscillation at the object's natural frequency, then in that case, it will resonate. Again, this new word. So the idea is that the the guitar string, for example, normally you're used to plucking a guitar string, you know, and it makes a, makes a noise like mm, whatever. But if you actually uh, put, say, a tuning fork next to the guitar, and the tuning fork was exactly the same frequency as the guitar string wanted to vibrate at, then you would actually see that the tuning fork would make the guitar string vibrate. And I don't mean by touching it. I mean by using the sound waves as they move through the air. So that might seem a little bananas, but it's actually, this is this is the idea, right? So basically using um, sound in my example to make things move at a distance. So um, again, something, if, if you haven't played guitar or you don't know about guitars, that's okay. But if you've played on a swing set, then this is the idea of you pumping your legs at the exact right time so that you get higher and higher and, you know, eventually you go, no, you, you don't usually go all the way around the swing, but I suppose it can happen. Okay, so another example of resonance is where you can take a wine glass and put it near to a speaker and then find the exact right frequency that the wine glass vibrates at. Again, typically this is one where if you run your finger across the top, you can actually hear. So this would be something in you know, in the in the frequencies that we can actually hear with our human ears. So the idea is then you play that sound with a speaker and then the wine glass will vibrate very, very quickly until eventually it shatters, okay? And so this is the YouTube video that I'm gonna link in later. Uh, a, a historical example, um, again, this idea of, um, that, that again is quite dramatic, showing how the wind, for example, can interact uh, with physical systems is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So this is a picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge here. 
And what happened in this case is that um, the wind was probably going like this. I don't know for a fact, but it was probably going like this. And the bridge basically started shaking back and forth and vibrating back and forth and buckle, buckling like this until eventually it shook itself apart. So that's why nowadays when engineers design buildings and bridges, they always make sure to include damping, which is basically a way of stopping these vibrations from building up and destroying the object. Okay, so these are so this one is the one I'm gonna link in. This video is the, the one I'm gonna link in um, uh, on the Google Classroom. So please check it out, it's kind of cool. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna link in this one because it's a bit long and, uh, well, anyway, maybe I'll do it. It's, it's kind of fun to watch, but you don't have to watch the whole thing. All right. Uh, yeah. So that's it for today. Um, again, please make sure to check out the other, the other, these two, these two other videos in uh, in the Google Classroom. This one for sure because it's short and kind of gets to the point. This one it's a little bit weird, but again, if you're like wondering how on earth could a bridge possibly uh, shatter due to wind, this one, you know, if you haven't seen it before, it's it's pretty cool. So, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.